Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Stanford Medicine today for our Building a Culture of Health Equity monthly series. We are so excited to be with you here today. My name is Magali Fasciotto, and I am the Associate Dean um, for Faculty Development and Diversity here at Stanford Medicine. Our program today is organized by Stanford Medicine's Office on Continuing Medical Education, the Stanford Medicine HEAL Network, the Stanford Medicine REACH Initiative, and the Stanford Medicine GME Diversity Committee. I would particularly like to thank the Office of Faculty Development and Diversity and the Stanford Center for Medical Education who have been instrumental in the planning process. As we begin today, I would like for us to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we sit here at Stanford Medicine. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. So now I, I have a couple of Zoom housekeeping items. Um, if you have any technical questions throughout today's webinar, please use the Zoom chat function and the webinar host will respond. We want this to be an interactive session, one in which we learn from our expert speakers as well as from one another. We invite you to use the Q&A button throughout the session if you'd like to submit a question to our speakers. Feel free, as I mentioned, to add your question at any point during the lecture, and we'll do our best to get to them during the Q&A segment. I'd also like to note that unfortunately, Dr. Juno Obedin Maliver is unable to join our session today. Our upcoming lectures are scheduled for Thursday, July 21st and Thursday, August 18th. You can stay up to date on the Building a Culture of Health Equity program by visiting Health Equity .stanford.edu. Now, as I mentioned, today's uh, session is sponsored in part by the HEAL Network. I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce HEAL in an effort to build support and community among Stanford Medicine community members who are engaged in health equity research. Our Stanford Medicine Office of Faculty Development and Diversity have launched the Health Equity Action Leadership or HEAL Network along with a series of events throughout the academic year. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Leslie Subak. Dr. Leslie L. Subak is professor and chair of obstetrics and gynecology at Stanford and founding director of the Stanford LGBTQ health program. She's a physician scientist with synergistic clinical and research interests in lower urinary tract function in women with methodological expertise in epidemiology, cost effectiveness, and clinical trials of interventions to improve urologic outcomes. Her group develops and investigates novel interventions for incontinence, such as weight loss, yoga, slow-paced respiration, and mobile health applications. She is committed to increasing opportunities for women and underrepresented minorities in medicine, including people of color and sexual and gender minorities. Welcome, Dr. Subak. Okay. Thanks so much, Magali, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm excited to kick off the day. Um, I'm first going to introduce um, Tandy A, who will be our first speaker. Um, and when Mitch Lunn is our second speaker, we'll introduce him. Um, Dr. Tandy A is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology and by courtesy in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health. She is a Pediatric Endocrinology Fellowship Director. She founded the Stanford Pediatric and Adolescent Gender Clinic and is currently the medical director for the Gender Clinic. Using neuroimaging and neurocognitive assessments, her research is focused on learning how hormones impact the developing brain, especially during adolescence. 
Recently, she's been looking at not only how sex hormones impact the brain, but also how the, how the bone and body composition of transgender and gender expansive youth, especially when a young person experiences exogenously induced puberty rather than programmed puberty. In addition, her team examines how family support and acceptance develops in this population, as well as cultural differences in gender therapy, particularly for the AAPI community. Tandy, thank you so much for being here today, and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you um, for that introduction, Leslie. And with that, I'll just uh, share my slides. There we go. Uh, so this morning, I wanted to talk about the health equity research in transgender and gender expansive uh, youth that my team is doing here at Stanford. And hopefully with this, you'll become familiar with some of the areas of research in pediatric transgender health. And this will also help you to understand the need for advancement in the field of both pediatric and adolescent gender health. So why now and you know, what are the gaps? I think gender health and research, particularly in gender health and medicine is really gonna be increasing over the next um, decades. And it really has to do with the fact that there's been formal establishment of gender clinics over the past five to seven years. Beforehand, it was all kind of done uh, one-offs here and there by different doctors. But now that there are um, protocols and formal clinics, there are even really an opportunity to start registries as well. And no registry really existed even in Europe until most recently. And unfortunately, gen in order for gender care to be advancing, medicine also needs to be prepared and to be proactive. Because when I was training uh, back in medical school, we had very little, if I think none, about gender health. And often if there was any uh, education, it was on LGBTQ plus health, it was mainly related to STDs. And there was little exposure, in fact, to the impact of gender affirming treatment. So at the same time, what's also happening is that this population of patients is also growing. Even um, almost five years ago, 0 0.7 to 2.7 of US youth were identifying as transgender, gender non-binary, or gender expansive. And we also have found more recently is that if youth are able to be affirmed in their gender at an earlier age, for instance, during adolescence, rather than being affirmed in adulthood, they're going to have better quality of life and do better. So with that, I think there's going to be an increased drive for parents and families and pediatricians to be able to seek gender affirming care. And medicine really needs to be prepared to prevent to be able to prevent any side effects, longitudinal issues that may come up and to actually follow because there are no really preventative and longitudinal care studies as they become adults. And more recently, when you look at the nation as a whole from a Gallup poll, even from two years ago shows that more percentages of the population are identifying as LGBT. And when you look at the uh, breakdown, and you can see what I like about this is really by when you are uh, born. And so the different uh, identifying generations and how that percentage is increasing. So this is not a population that we need to forget about, especially when we're talking about health equity. As a role for us in providers that we need to also remember is when we have the opportunity to meet these patients in our clinic, we need to remember that it took a lot for people to be able to come in and seek care. Because when you look at the adults, in fact, 24 to almost 50% of those who uh, seek care feel that the medical community was discriminating or they experienced some amount of discrimination depending on the healthcare setting. So whether it's in an emergency room or a primary care provider or subspecialist clinic, so it's really, for me, I look at it as a privilege every time someone has actually sought the care and has come into our clinical setting and is meeting a medical provider because it took a lot of courage for them to come. And the other thing is, you know, when you look at it, because of this discrimination, they were two, 20 times more likely to not seek care 
or to wait until the need for care is just so much more uh, serious, more further developed in a uh, situation. And this was not just for adults, even in pediatrics. So even kids know and can sense this difference so that the transgender youth rated themselves as being in worse health and less likely to seek preventative care because they were worried about what would a provider think. So our role as providers, as we're learning how to provide better health equity, um, we really need to remember this and give up opportunities for our patients. So what's the therapy? And I want to just kind of talk a little bit about that before we talk about what's the research that goes with that therapy. I will acknowledge that um, therapy in transgender youth is a little bit controversial in some states. But I also want to caution that people are often just as soon as they hear, you know, therapy, they're thinking about hormone therapy and surgery and are way far in advance. And perhaps what we're thinking about in terms of therapy has to do with the holistic approach to the child or the adolescent or the youth. So what we're talking about is, is there support? Is there mental health provided um, support, family support? Are there opportunities to be able to provide a 360 environment that is safe for the um, kids and the youth that we see? So the first thing, you know, in integral to any young person is the family and the parents. So one of the first studies that we did is looking at the perception of how support is seen, not only by the parents, but also the youth at the same time. So in this study, we asked the parents and the youth um, who came to our clinic and we separated them. And we asked them, you know, what are identifying moments in their journey of revealing their gender identity and coming to care? And then for each of the moments that the parents stated, we asked them how did they feel in terms of supporting their youth and, and accepting their youth, which are two um, different things that are happening. And then we also asked the same questions for the same events to the youth. And then we did a comparison to see what was um, the feelings of one parent it, compared to what the youth was experiencing. And we found that for the youth, the most important thing when they come out with disclosure to any adult, particularly parents, is that they just want it to be heard and respected for what they just shared with the older adult and guardian, and they wanted their name and pronoun to be used. So I feel like that's something that's um, very doable, easy. People worry about permanent effects and side effects. And I say, you know, this is pretty um, an easy thing to do without any side effects. And the parents were the ones who were thinking about, oh, I have to get them to a doctor's. I need to do this. I need to do that. What if? But the fact that the youth just wanted was that initial acknowledgement. Was What was even more surprising after that is the adolescents were asked, you know, what was the second item? And what they wanted was actually for the adults to continue to listen to them, to be there for discussions when asked, but not for advice necessarily, but just the place in which they can express themselves. And when needed, what they appreciated was a hug or a listening ear from their parents. So again, the top two items that the youth found that was um, really helpful in both support and acceptance and treatment was actually things that didn't really involve a lot of the medical community. The other things then that we look at and the way we approach this research is, you know, as the patients are coming to our clinic and families are coming, what are the questions that I'm asked and what can we provide for scientific support? And we also found that there were cultural factors that also played a role. And that has to do with what a culture's uh, gender roles and gender expression may be. And there was also an intersection with uh, religion. And our clinic happens to have, because of the location, I believe, the highest number of Asian Americans, Hawaiian, that's Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations in any gender clinic. So we wanted to start looking at what makes them to be unique because there are some uniqueness. And we're now working on the second part of comparing it to other cultural identities. And interestingly, the reason for why patients will come has to do, you know, range anywhere. And this is for one calendar year, we looked at what the chief complaint was. 
Yes, the top reason was for gender affirming uh, hormone therapy, but some were just for menstrual suppression. A lot of them wanted mental health referrals, but some were just for medical diagnoses or learning about um, more about um, what it meant to be uh, gender nonconforming or gender diverse and also about hormone blockers. And then what we're looking at is, does the age at which the youth are identifying going to differ among the different cultures? And of course, there's identification to themselves, to the family, and then to the friends. And does that differ by the identity of the youth um, themselves? So whether they're trans um, male or masculine, trans uh, female, feminine, or non-binary. And this is still a uh, work that uh, we are doing right now. And I think this information is helpful for families as they come. And also the timing of social uh, transition is another thing I just had wanted to share to show the um, differences in when someone may be coming out and socially transitioning. But we're looking at this data for hormones and surgeries and other intervention as well. And as I'm just kind of showing what some of the research that's being done, there's also stuff that's being done on therapy and what's being described whether it's based on the Dutch uh, protocol in which a lot of us have adapted in the treatment and it's getting uh, updated by uh, the standards. And all of the treatments do begin after careful discussion among family, patients, mental health providers, and medical team. And the standards are always discussed and updated through WPATH. But one of the things I wanted to caution is that a lot of the guidelines have been developed based on adult therapies and surgeries. And when medical and surgical therapies were not easily and readily available. But now we have to be responsible as um, providers in pediatrics to look at the evidence and understand the implications. So our next um, set is to really look at what's happening to our patients at the time in which therapy is given and what the side effects and things to monitor will be for. So just to be clear, um, you have patients who may receive at the onset of puberty or middle of puberty up to 10 or three, some GnRH agonist therapy before uh, starting hormones of gender affirming hormones, or they can either come at the completion of pubertal development and would start with gender affirming hormones with uh, gender um, or pubertal blocker or GnRH agonist added in later. So what we're trying to look here is what are the sex differences in various incidences of mental health um, illnesses? Because we know that the way they emerge at puberty may be impacted by possibly testosterone and estrogen. And so when you're giving gender affirming uh, hormone treatment, will this change any of it? In particular, will this also be changing the neurocognitive responses to it? The other area also is, of course, it's not only the brain that's getting impacted, but what about the other changes in the body, particularly the bone and the skeletal uh, structure as people are growing, and then about the body composition, not only in the muscle mass, the fat distribution, muscle strength, and function. So I quickly went over some of the research that um, I've done, and really, you know, the reason why I want to be in this area is that there's a capacity to really make the difference in the lives of the youth and especially in, when there's such a health dis, um, inequality uh, or inequity. And why do I stay is that as an ally, I feel it's such an advantage um, and an honor for me to be able to hear and to share stories from patients and families and to advance the fields. And then of course, to continue to teach, train and collaborate with other providers. So thank you for allowing me to share that. Fabulous, Tandy, thank you so much. Um, Tandy, thank you so much. Your work is really an inspiration. I know your clinical work very well um, and your research and the marriage of the two is um, tremendously beneficial, beneficial to your patients as well as to what you can teach all of us. Um, I. Before I introduce Mitch, I want to say that I um, neglected to um, read a tiny bit of my introduction at the beginning, um, which is that after we have um, our, our speakers, we'll have a question and answer um, session um, for all of you to participate, and you can enter them as is noted in the, in the chat um, in the Q&A feature. Um, we also, we have, uh, thank you, <laughs> sorry, now I'd like to introduce Mitch Lunn. 
Um, Dr. Mitchell Lunn is an assistant professor of medicine and nephrology um, and of epidemiology and population health at Stanford. Mitch combines his interest in sexual and gender minority or SGM health and technology to design and deploy digital solutions to address issues related to participant engagement, recruitment and retention. Mitch is the co-director of the PRIDE study, a national longitudinal, longitudinal cohort study of SGM adult health and co-principal investigator of PRIDE-NET, a national community engagement network focused on catalyzing SGM health research. Thank you, Mitch. We'll turn it over to you and can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Leslie. Let me just get my slides up here for, uh, for everybody. Um, there we go. All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's great to be here. And thanks to all the attendees for, for coming today. Delighted to, to share a little bit about, uh, about um, my path and the path of Juno Obedin Malover, who regrets that she's unable uh, to be here today. Um, to start, we've been funded by both federal and non federal sources, as well as some private philanthropy and other foundations, um, but otherwise have no uh, professional or financial conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Um, um, to start, I wanted to share a little bit about me. So you heard that my name is Mitch. I use he, him, and his pronouns. I'm a, um, for those of you who are uh, blind or have difficulty seeing, I'm a uh, white cisgender man. I have brown hair. I have facial hair. I'm wearing a flowered uh, shirt today. Um, and I'm originally from North Dakota. I grew up in the Midwest until uh, I went away to college um, and delighted to share a little bit of, of the path um, that, uh, that I've had um, before we get into some of the actual work uh, that we've been doing in the Pride study. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Pride Month. It is still June. Uh, it's happy Pride Day every day for me but it is June uh, <laughs> where 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 people um you know, uh, focus on the LGBT community. I'd also like to recognize that there's been numerous uh, transgressions in the, you know, from medicine and science in the community and also from society uh, to LGBTQ plus people. So over the decades, we've overcome a lot and we have a lot to be, be proud of, but we also have really a long way to go. And that's even in the United States, much less um, in places around the world where, uh, where LGBTQ people have fewer rights and, uh, and fewer freedoms. So um, thanks for coming today. Um, we were asked to talk a little bit about, about my journey, and it's really not just my journey, but it's really our journey, because um, my dear friend and collaborator, Juno Obedin Maliver, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, with Dr. Subak, um, we met back in medical school when we were Stanford med students um, in 2005 or so. So we've been working together for the past 17 years. Um, and part of the work that we, along with two of our med school classmates, the four of us, really got struck um, about LGBT medical education and wondering what providers were being taught uh, about how to care for, for LGBTQ plus people. So the four of us started a, a medical education research group back in the day uh, that has um, you know, made uh, these, uh, these kind of three different papers. Um, uh, probably the one that we're most famous for is the, is the one on the left. Um, which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, looking at how much content LGBT uh, related content is taught to, to, to medical students. This over the years led um, to, you know, an increase across the country of, of, of care. And now Stanford thankfully has its LGBTQ plus health program, which, which, uh, which all of us on the call are excited to, uh, to be a part of. Um, this provides, um, you know, as an, as an internist, as an internal medicine doctor, I see patients in, in Stanford's clinic as a primary care provider. There are other specialties, including OBGYN, dermatology, endocrine, psych, uh, reproductive of endocrine and infertility uh, and some surgical specialties. And of course, Tandy operates the, the pediatric and adolescent side of this, entire, of this entire enterprise. So Stanford is continuing to grow and being sure to provide LGBTQ friendly patient care um, in addition to education of medical students and physician assistant students uh, throughout uh, its, its schools and education programs, moving into residencies and fellowships in various departments. And of course, other research and scholarships such that uh, such as what Tandy spoke about earlier and what I'll uh, talk about today. So 
Juno and I kind of separated our ways for, for residency, but came back uh, during fellowship time and thought about um, what we would do next. And we decided to pivot from focusing on medical education from, you know, from medical students and, and educating physicians to actually looking at what, what patients care about um, and what their health outcomes and health experiences are. So we started um, by looking at, a, at taking an approach that was perhaps a little bit different, which is is um, looking at uh, a community engaged approach. And so instead of saying academia knows and us in our ivory tower and the privilege that we have as, as, as white people, as professors at, at, some of, at some of the most prestigious universities, instead, what does the community want us to study? What are their concerns? And so we made this video that I'm going to share back in 2015 or so. Um, and the statements that are mentioned in here really are things that unfortunately I think still ring true today and inspire much of the work uh, uh, that we do. So I'll share this video. The audio hopefully will work fine. The video may be a little choppy over Zoom. Are we good with the sound? Okay. I'm a Russian speaking gay Catholic. Chinese Mexican. Latina. White male. Biracial. Bisexual. Trans woman. Lesbian. Colombian American. I kept trying to come out to my parents, but they really don't understand. <laughs> I mean, I like being a lesbian. I don't wish I was straight at all. I think that this makes me special. And especially in this time and age, being gay is seen as an asset. You know, the person who really uh, is most accepting of my transgender identity is my mom. She came at me um, with a knife and um, screaming that she would rather see me dead than, than uh, living the life that I was living. I knew that there were aspects of who I was and how I was in the world that were not welcomed in the medical world. When I visit a new doctor, it's always a challenge. I had colon cancer about 10 years ago. One of the first things I feel like I have to do is kind of dispense with this notion that I'm straight. You know, so what are you using for, for birth control? And I said, nothing. You don't want to go into a clinic and then end up having to educate your own doctor. And she just stopped and she looked at me like, like I'm an idiot. That's what they're there for, they should already know. You know, going to the doctor should be a safe place. I try to avoid situations where I feel like I'm going to be stigmatized or discriminated against, but I know that that is something that I can't always control. Our community has gone through an enormous number of hard things over many, many years. You know, thing after thing hits us and, um, and we always come back. I mean, really, the community provides, in many ways, everything. We really need to join together as the diverse and dynamic communities that we are and um, help to transform the health system together. I always feel that if my struggles can help someone else not have to go through the same thing I went through, then it hasn't all been in vain. So it was really, you know, after talking to community members and doing um, kind of some quote unquote market research, we really decided that we needed to do something about this. And we ended up creating the PRIDE study, which uh, stands for Population Research in Identity and Disparities for Equality, and it has this overarching question. And it's not necessarily a research question, but it's a kind of a guiding question, which is how does being an LGBTQ plus person, a sexual and or gender minority person, how does that influence your physical, mental, and social health? So even though Juno as an OBGYN and I'm an internist and a nephrologist doesn't necessarily mean that we're focusing only on physical health because we know that people's identities and their experiences in society uh, influence their mental health and social health as well. And we wanted to make sure that we kept this community engaged approach, you know, through our work. And so these are our kind of five engagement principles or guiding principles that we follow. And I usually start in the upper right hand corner here, which is that participants know best. Again, if this is not a study from academia. It's a study from the community that is that is conducted by academia in partnership with the community. So we um, really rely on participants to share their feedback and get, give us insight and guidance. And we've created a variety of structures um, to make sure that we are engaged with the community at all times. Uh, the vast majority of our team, 95-ish percent or so, identify as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And we view that it's our right uh, because of the privilege that we have um, to give back uh, 
results and to give back to the community. So there's a sense of duty as a part of this as well. Because um, community members do know best, we want them to be engaged from beginning to end. So that includes the research question development to how studies are conducted, to the analysis, to the interpretation to make sure it's done correctly and that it's actually um, uh, disseminated back to communities rather than just going into a medical journal that is hard to access uh, and oftentimes uh, may not be written in languages that are under, in a language that is, that is accessible. We want to be easily accessible, which is why we're an online study and want to make it easy for people to participate. So the Pride Study is a national online study. Anybody can join from pridestudy.org. Um, as long as you identify as an LGBTQ plus person, there's no quiz, there's no blood test. Uh, and I don't, right now we're available only to adults, so under uh, 18 years of age or older, uh, who live in the United States uh, or its territories. And we've had um, several phases. I'm going to talk more about our most current phase, which is phase two, that's actually now enrolled more than 24,000. Uh, folks. And this is um, a custom built web platform that we've built. So we decided that we needed to build our own technology in order to do a lot of the work uh, that we wanted to do. So this is an example of the Pride Studies research platform hosted in Google Cloud um, in a HIPAA compliant way. All the databases are encrypted, uh, both when they're sitting there in the database and of course, when they're being uh, transmitted in various ways to your web browser. Um, and participants primarily, um, you know, participate in 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 survey-based participant-reported uh, information. We're soon moving into blood collection and a few other exciting avenues. But this is uh, the the interface in which we uh, collect information from folks and they participate. We also provide data back to them, real-time statistics about their participation and the rest of the cohort. Um, we've done this in a variety of uh, you know, tech enabled ways, including notifying people of, of various uh, aspects. We verify their email address and phone numbers. We validate their mailing addresses. If you've ever bought anything from Amazon and it kind of collect, corrects your mailing address to something a little different, that's actually confirming that that address is, may, is deliverable by the US Postal Service. So it helps us know where people live because we know that people's environment and neighborhoods impact their life as well. And then we provide some active encouragement like this flying rainbow unicorn here to help uh, advise and, and uh, encourage people to um, complete the data. The annual questionnaire is our largest instrument. This takes about an hour to complete every year, has topics, some of which some examples are shown here on the screen. And we do this to really, um, we've created this to create a very, um, uh, with, a pay, with the participant experience in mind so that people are selecting uh, uh, logic, uh, they're selecting questions and getting a survey that is most tailored to them based on their answers earlier in the survey. And we of course use other instruments, other surveys like uh, the PHQ-9, which is a commonly used instrument for depression. It's nine questions to screen about depression. Or for example, the audit, which is used for alcohol use disorder to look at problematic alcohol use. And those are used on national surveys across the country. We deployed them in the Pride study as well so that we can draw comparisons. As I wrap up, I wanted to share just a couple, a couple findings. Uh, there's a, there are many, um, but really, uh, you know, we've taken advantage of the longitudinal nature of the Pride study. We have time points prior to the beginning of the COVID pandemic and then a time point relatively early in the pandemic. And we were able to look at changes in depression and anxiety amongst the entire cohort. And we saw, of course, not probably uns unsurprisingly, that both depression and anxiety increased as a part of the pandemic. But that was primarily driven by people who didn't have anxiety or depression earlier pre-pandemic, it was new anxiety uh, and depression uh, amongst, amongst LGBTQ plus people. Additionally, because we have so many LGBTQ plus people as participants, we're able to break out those letters of L, G, B, T, and Q and start looking at the subpopulations, disaggregating the communities among the LGBTQ plus umbrella. And so we looked at eating disorder behaviors, and this is a completely unstudied uh, group in the eating disorder literature. And we've been able to validate uh, measures uh, that have been that are now used, um, you know, across the across the world, frankly, in studying uh, in studying uh, eating disorders and muscle dysmorphia amongst LGBTQ plus people. 
We've also, as I mentioned, um, changed a little bit of the language. On the example on the left here, you can see some, uh, these are from some national surveys, like the National Survey on Family Growth, which asked the question, and what about your partner at the time you became pregnant? Did he want you to have another baby? The, the assumption here is that people are in uh, presumably a cisgender heterosexual relationship where the partner is a he. Um, and similarly, the bottom question, did you or your partner do anything the last time you had sex to keep you from getting pregnant? The assumption here is that pregnancy or that sex pregnancy is possible based on the type of sex that's happening here. In this case, it's kind of assuming, you know, sperm near a vagina. And so we've created, done a variety of technology uh, ways to make really questions better and more appropriate for LGBTQ plus people. This is just an example of some of the uh, studies that are currently underway within the PRIDE study because we collect data on so many different things. There's a, we really view ourselves as a data resource for researchers to collaborate with us and answer questions on a variety of topics, as you can see, see here, things from migraine headache to conversion therapy to vaccinations to, to cancer. So um, thank you all for your attention. Again, this is many, many more people than just me uh, and, and more than Juno. Uh, we have a whole team of folks that are uh, varying expertise from communications to engagement and mobilization to research coordinators um, to, um, to uh, epidemiologists and, uh, and operations specialists. So thank you all for your attention. Uh, delighted to turn it back over to Dr. Subak who can uh, get us into the Q&A. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Tandy. Um, your work is really an inspiration. Um, I want to open this up to Q&A from everyone who's joining us today. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A tab. And there we go. So um, uh, Mitch, Tandy, please, one of you jump in, whoever would like to. Tandy, this is actually for you. Can the gender clinic do in-house assessments for pediatric patients without parental consent? Thinking of patients admitted for psychiatric support who are also exploring their gender identity in their preteens, but parents are not receptive to a referral to the gender clinic. Yeah, unfortunately, we've been seeing more and more where um, our patients are presenting acutely. What we can do right now, we have an outpatient um, psychologist and we're having the physician to consider expanding so that the outpatient person can have an inpatient and an outpatient role. In the past, we've had that one person just to do an introduction and meet mainly with the parents first um, to kind of calm down their, um, you know, a lot of times they're just learning about uh, the child's identity and to kind of calm and just tell them we're gonna talk about this more and then see them on an outpatient front. Uh, right now, what we can do it is by a conversation. And then sometimes that initial meeting might be with the parents and our gender psychologist outpatient um, as a first step. Excellent, thank you, Tandy. And there, there are a couple more for you, so we'll just bring them on. Um, given the current political climate in states like Texas and Florida, especially towards trans kids seeking gender affirming care, I wonder if things haven't regressed since 2015. I, I, I do um, worry that in some of the states uh, that it has become almost like a regression in that it, the care is not going to be allowed for. However, on the other hand, um, we have a lot of people who feel like this is wrong, this is not the way it should be, and it's actually has motivated and energized to ensure that in the states where there is care, how can we continue to protect that and how can we work in helping those families get um, the services that they need? And I think the families are also feeling energized and not taking the no as an answer. Excellent, and following on that, with this past spring's criminalization in Alabama of being trans and trans youths being forced to medically detransition or making it illegal to provide gender affirming care and medical care in general to trans youth, what can be done to help trans adolescents, if anything, be safe medically, mentally, physically um, in those areas? Yeah, that, that's a big um, loaded question. And what we, I think one that all of us can do is advocacy. Um, trying to provide the mental health support during this time. I know there's um, a lot of litigation that is going on. And part of it, you know, 
people are being creative and saying, you know, you, physicians can't abandon their patients. So there are cases that, you know, say we need to be able to continue it and providing other means, perhaps if they um, are able to get care elsewhere and to make it be um, easier, but giving that mental health uh, support and also trying to think about creative ways in which we can provide that care is um, also being done. Great, Tandy. Thanks. Um, Mitch, I'd like to direct this one to you. Um, I recently read about best practices in trans-affirming clinical language and how some trans people have complicated feelings about their bodies, especially genitals or secondary sex characteristics. These best practices include using, quote, upper body, quote, instead of, quote, breast and chest, um, erogenous or erectile tissue, external genitals, or genitals instead of penis, external gonads instead of testes, testicles, etc., is this language that the medical community is moving towards, especially for these, uh, for those caring for this community, or is this the yeah, language? Great. Yeah, 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 great question. Yeah, so I think there's, I think from a clinical perspective, you know, the way that I think is the the best approach is to always use the language that the that the patient is is using. So it's very common when I'm first meeting, say, a, a, you know, an adult patient who's interested in, in transitioning. We have a, a pretty in depth discussion about what I call their gender history, right? Their you know their path for, as to how they've come to their current gender identity today. And part of that gender history not only is their their path there, but also then a discussion about their body currently and whether they have. Um, feelings of, of stress or which gets sometimes called a, you know, dysphoria uh, about particular aspects of their body. And they might say, you know what, I, I don't like this part or this part. And I say, what do you call this part, right? You know, and so it's, it's important really to ask them what terms they use for, for specific organs. I think as a whole, we are moving towards things that are a little less gendered, the terms themselves are a little less gendered, um, and and um, and really making sure that the patient is affirmed in whatever language is using. As a, as a whole community, we are moving away from using terms like breast, for example, and moving more towards, you know, a chest reduction or a chest augmentation, for example. Um, and, and, and there, of course, are a variety of terms depending on what surgery or gender affirming procedures being done. From a research perspective, we also try to include those terms in, in, in the studies that people are participating in. So with technologies now, we can say, okay, there's the, the medical community calls, you know, this organ a penis. What do you call it? And then we can take whatever pay, whatever language the research participant is using and pipe that into the questions that they have going forward so that it doesn't say, how do you feel about your penis? Instead of how do you feel about your whatever word you call it, right? You know, and so I think there's some other ways, you know, technology is really making it to create more affirming and welcoming experiences for participant for research participants so that they actually provide us with meaningful data and are feeling good about that experience while they're doing it rather than having you know, a traumatic experience to participate in research is uh, what we're trying, of course, to avoid. Great, thank you, Mitch. Um, and how does intergenerational trauma affect both of your areas of expertise? I'm happy to start, Tandy, if you are. <laughs> sure, okay. So uh, so I think, you know, uh, it does, right? I think that is the short answer, um, is that, you know, many people, you know, it, we've had we have some people who have grown up with, um, you know, not having uh, experienced a lot of trauma from their families, but we have had a lot that have had, um, you know, very um, negative experiences, maybe from family members or family members have then initiated other things, things like uh, people may be familiar with the term conversion therapy, which are these, these approaches uh, that are now outlawed in many states, including in California, but are designed to make people straight or make people not transgender. Um, they're oftentimes run by religious organizations organizations, um, and they sometimes get nicknamed Pray the Gay Away. Um, and they've been shown, shown to be nothing but but harmful. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, those may have been um, some traumatic experiences that have been initiated by family members, aside from direct, direct trauma from family members, being kicked out of houses, being verbally or physically, physically abused. And those, of course, have long lasting uh, effects for, for, for many years and affect how people, uh, you know, interact and make their way through society. 
I think the other part also for some of our patient population, especially if they're of um, other minorities or of color, they bring a lot of other baggage from just having enough um, hardship in getting through the world that on top of it to have a patient identify or have a young child or a youth identify um, with it or are questioning their gender, it, it also adds that extra layer. So I think some of it gets um, placed, you know, an extra burden. And that's why a lot of the parents are a little bit hesitant to start the journey. But we just try to help with, you know, um, how do you reduce minority stress and how can we provide that psychoeducation? Not only, we end up not only treating our young person, but probably the whole family as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, and are there professional led mental health support groups available for patients and families at Stanford? As much research has shown, having a positive relationship with the family is important for the mental health of trans youth. I feel like it would be positive to have family therapy available to trans youth and their families. I, I, I'll, I'll take that one first, Mitch. Uh, I know locally uh, we're uh, fortunate that there are actually three or four local um, support groups for the parents. So we're not offering that because such of, um, groups exist. But one of the things that we have just started um, offering are professionally trained parent mentors. So they're not therapists, but they're parents who've had the similar experience to be an ear and to listen. So parent mentoring, um, they go through a different level of um, training professionally for this uh, role and they're parents of kids who have already transitioned. So we're starting to roll that out. And um, also up in the coming events are some community events that we like to offer where there'll be opportunity for either the parents at the same time or separately to be able to um, kind of have discussions with each other, but we are using the community programs for parent-led support groups. Great, thanks, Sandy. And Mitch, I'll send this back to you. How does the PRIDE study target what gets studied? Uh, Dr. Lund mentioned collecting feedback to target research that's important to the queer community, but having participated in the PRIDE study for some time, it's unclear to me how to provide this information. Yeah, great question. So we've done, we do a couple things. So the first thing that we did is prior to having the Pride Study on a web-based platform, we actually initially launched in an iPhone app and collected, had about 18,000 participants in that phase that created, the purpose of that phase really was to look at SGM research priorities from the community. So community members could participate in a, um, in a, in a, in a forum that was kind of like Reddit where you would create a question thread and you could have discussion about it and vote things up and down. So that was one way. The other way is we always welcome feedback at either support or contact at pridestudy.org. And I can, somebody can, I can maybe throw that in the chat to everybody. If you ever have topics that you want to discuss being studied, that's um, that's one a way that we collect information. We get all, we review feedback from participants every quarter and we get feedback every week, positive and negative about questions that we ask and topics that we're studying. And we, um, our entire research advisory committee meets, um, we meet every two weeks, but every quarter we discuss really how to, um, what changes we need to make in the future in particular, um, particular, uh, you know, topic areas. And that leads to another question, which I see in the Q&A, which is, um, can a researcher access the Pride Study Day to, to build their own projects? And so if you are a researcher, the answer is yes. And even if you're a community member, we can partner with you. So you don't even need to have the, the research skills. We'll have conversations with you. And there's a variety of ways that this can happen. One is that it can be data that we've already collected, but we are not going to be the people to necessarily answer that particular research question. And you may have a particular expertise in that. And so that's that's a great partnership. The other way is like maybe you want to dive in deep about a specific topic. We can work with you to create a survey that will then go out to either the entire cohort of the Pride Study or a subset of that cohort um, uh, to help answer that particular research question. So the answer is yes. We have more data than Juno and me and our team will ever be able to to analyze. So we definitely need help for people who are passionate about certain topics. 
And while we're on help, Mitch, does the Pride Study have <laughs> internships available for undergraduate students? Yeah, great question. So uh, we do, actually. So just this um, this year is our first year. We just launched uh, two weeks ago our, our summer internship program. So we have four undergraduate students that are working with us this summer. But in addition to that, we do have a, uh, a lab of about 20 to 30 uh, trainees at all different levels from undergraduate students all the way up to junior faculty members and they're not even all in the bay area some people are across the country we meet uh weekly and everybody has you know they're either part of a project or their own project that they work with under the mentorship of of some of the private study uh faculty and and staff so there is we want to make sure that we're training the next generation of lgbtq health researchers um as this is really a growing field that uh as i think you've heard today from from uh, from everybody needs um, needs more people <laughs> involved. And so as much as we can do, we're happy to, to, to help achieve that mission as well. Great. Thank you, Mitch. We're going to change gears just a little bit. Um, as experts in queer healthcare, I'm curious as to your thoughts on sex and gender being displayed for a patient when a chart is opened. If there's only room for one, which do you think is more pertinent to care? And do you think we should rethink how we approach patient care based on their sex or gender? Tendi, you want to start with this one from the the, the epic build of LPCH? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is something that we've been working a lot on. And I think uh, what's been um, really nice is now we are, um, at least on, on the pediatric side, you can put in the name that you use uh, to show up. Um, it will also show up with the legal name just because of insurance purposes. And then uh, the gender identity shows up as well as the biomarker. And the gender identity can be whatever the person identifies as and can actually um, type it in as well. So there's a lot of uh, what we call, um, some people have known it as SOGI, but I uh, feel like it should be more of GISO, which is gender identity and then um, sexual orientation as needed. And so in our EPIC system, there's a whole form that not only talks about uh, the name used, pronouns used, identity, as well as romantic relationships. Um, and then there's some more personal inventories um, about body um, parts and uh, other personal information that can go on for providers as well. From the adult side, I really wish it was cool, like it was on the pediatric side, uh, that, that more of that popped up. We do have, obviously, the name that you use may be different from your legal name, and that pops up immediately on um, on Epic. There are, and and we also have um, your current um, current gender identity can also come up that way. I wish there were a little differences in how it was presented, but I think that is you know is pretty is pretty important, um, you, you know, to show that information so that people, both the provider, can help can you know can potentially be cued in about what organs you may or may not have and what um, what your current identity is. Um, I do wish that it was presented in a little bit of a different way. And I think that all of that information is important to, to present along with pronouns, which don't currently do not show up on the on the banner for uh, for the adult side um, that does show up um, in some specialty notes, for example, in our LGBTQ health practice in Los Altos, we have that come up so that exists, uh, but it does not show up across the entire health system and these are some of the changes that we hope to be making in the in the coming in the coming time uh, so that uh, people can be referred to by not only the correct their correct name, but also their correct pronouns. Excellent. Thank you. And a quickie, as our country shifts to address loss of access to abortion care, what's the best language to advocate for people who do not identify as women or female? So I sure wish Juno were here so that she could, <laughs> that she could comment on this. Uh, but uh, I believe that the, the best language to use, and Leslie, you you probably know you're you're probably the best person to answer this question. But is um, is as pregnant person, uh, and that um, you know rather than using a typically gendered term like man or woman, um, that pregnant person is kind of a generic term. But just a reminder that you know trans men can be pregnant, cisgender women can be pregnant. People's identity. Uh, does not necessarily um, align or coincide with the with their 
ability to be pregnant or what organs they have. So pregnant person, I think, is the best uh, generic uh, term to describe every person who has the ability to be pregnant. And, and if I may, just taking a step back, even just to say a person with a uterus as well, you know, if, if not even pregnant yet. Excellent. Great. Well, I want I there are so many more questions that we don't have time to get to that cover a variety of topics. Um, if there's a way that we can type an answer in after the session, that would be fantastic. And Mitch um, and Tandy, I invite you to do that. And there are some that are in the chat that we won't be able to see. But thank you both very, very much. Um, I'd like to, to first and foremost thank our incredible panelists for their time here today. I'd also like to thank you, our attendees, for your engagement today. Um, fantastic questions, really thinking out of the box and really helping us as we move forward um, to advance care for the sexual and gender minority community. Um, the link to complete the evaluation and claim credit will be emailed to you by the end of the day. We take feedback very seriously and appreciate all that you might be willing to share. We look forward to providing additional educational opportunities about health equity next year and we hope in person, both in person and online. The Stanford Medicine Office of Faculty Development and Diversity, the Stanford Center for Continuing Medical Education, Stanford Medicine REACH Initiative, the Stanford Medicine GME Diversity Committee, and the HEAL community will continue to share knowledge, resources, and support with the goal of working toward health equity. In community, people are a powerful force for transformative change. We invite you to both build and take part in the HEAL community. So thank you very, very much for your attendance today. Um, and Mitch um, and Tandy, you are as ever a tremendous resource and such, um, such great collaborators and, and care providers. We look forward to how you advance um, everything we're doing at Stanford in all of our missions, um, our clinical care, research um, and education. So thank you all very, very much. And Mitch and Tandy, please, uh, if you can, answer the additional questions uh, so people can see them in the future.